I'm joined now by Dr. Mather Karskalen. He is the president and founder of LGC Inc. Mather, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Uh, Mather, let's start with an overview. What is it exactly that LGC does? So we're a biosynthetic cannabinoid company, and as our name states, we produce biosynthetic cannabinoids using algae. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you can use algae to grow plants? So, so for argument's sake, algae are like microscopic plants. Huh. So we're basically taking the genes from cannabis plants and we're putting them in the algae so that they produce cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. And so what cannabinoids can be produced, which ones can't be produced, or is there any such limitation? There's not really a limitation. The only limitation is just the time and energy needed to perfect the actual gene insertions and finding a strain of algae that will produce it uh, in the quantities and quality that you're looking for. Okay, and why algae? I mean, others are trying to develop biosynthetic cannabinoids on yeast and bacteria, for example, what attracts you to algae? Right, so I mean, you can really start to see the superiority of algae when you break it down into kind of three steps. So I mean, you've got your inputs, your nutrients, then you've got the organism itself, and then you've got all the waste products and the outputs at the back end. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the inputs, um, yeast and bacteria pretty much all require sugar to grow. So now you're competing with the food industry, you also need a pre-processed uh, nutrient source in order to feed them. In addition, the actual growth of it has to be in a fermentation tank. So you're very limited in how you can grow algae, where you can grow it, where you can source that sugar. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, algae can be grown using sunlight and carbon dioxide, they can be grown using sugar, they can be grown using chemicals, and also just like a myriad mixture of all of those combined. So you've just got much more of a, a versatile organism that can be grown you know, anywhere in the world using the you know, abundant resources of that area. Mm -hmm. When we move on to the organism itself, I like to think of all the microorganisms as a little assembly line. So you have inputs come in, a bunch of processes happen, and you have an output come out. So if you look at bacteria and yeast, they would be like a car assembly factory where you'd have to buy the chassis and your doors and your seats from another producer, and then it would put the engine in and complete the product. Right? So they don't naturally have all the material inside of them needed to produce cannabinoids. Algae are different in that they have all the natural precursors for the cannabinoids naturally abundant inside of them. Hmm. So you can produce your car from scratch. And then lastly, you've got the output. So I think this is where a lot of companies have failed to sort of um, look into, in that once you produce your actual cannabinoids and you extract them, what are you going to do with your waste products? So algae, um, algae are beautiful in that they have uh, an abundant of utility. So I mean, they're high producers of omega-3s, they're high in protein, uh, vitamins, minerals. So they're a superfood that's branded and is naturally um, you know, abundant across the world and also from a, a consumer perspective is a very consumer friendly product. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> the sort of holy grail in biosynthetics is producing cannabinoids in sufficient quantity and at a at a rate where the economics makes sense. Mm -hmm. So in order to succeed, you need to be able to produce cannabinoids at a fraction of what they're produced for through cultivation. Correct. And so where are you at in that sort of process? Have you actually evolved to the point where you can produce commercial quantities of, of CBD and THC using algae at commercially uh, preferable prices relative to cultivation. Right, so we plan for the worst and we hope for the best. So in a worst case scenario, we're looking at uh, about a 1% concentration in the algae. And so uh, given that concentration, we're still looking at a $350 a kilo for pure cannabinoid extract. So in our, even in our worst case scenario, we're, we're very strong from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so how soon then until you're actually producing cannabinoids in commercial quantities? Yeah, so uh, Q1, Q2 of next year is the schedule for, uh, for hitting commercial scale. So the commercial growth trials start this summer, hmm. uh, in addition to expanding out our portfolio of different strains and species of algae that we're using. Wow, and is it your expectation that producing cannabinoids on algae is going to largely disrupt cannabinoids from cultivated sources? I think that they'll, they'll always be that purest market that will exist out there, people that want the, the cannabis Premium plants. Flower. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, biosynthetic cannabinoids are completely gonna change the name of the game, both from a consistency and a quality perspective and just a price perspective. And it also, it also opens up doors into the pharmaceutical industry, right? Which is something that um, hasn't really been able to happen at a, at a proper scale. Mm -hmm. have, um, have you considered that the uh, market is going to be somewhat resistant to the concept of a genetically modified <coughs> organism as a source for cannabinoids? I mean, the reality is, is pretty much everything we eat is genetically modified, right? Um, you know, to a certain extent, everything in nature is genetically modified. It just takes longer in order to do it. The nice thing about using algae as opposed to a yeast or bacteria is algae are, are, as I said earlier, just a microscopic plant. So you're basically just having one plant do the work of another one just more efficiently, as opposed to using something like a bacteria or a yeast, um, which just doesn't fit as well. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, research has shown that some of the minor cannabinoids, which are not generally available in high quantity mm -hmm. naturally in a cultivated plant, mm -hmm. might be of high scientific value, clinical value to different indications in patients. Is it conceivable that you will be able to target specific minor cannabinoids and express them in commercial quantity far superior in a far superior way than t to cultivated cannabis? Yeah, absolutely. And this is this is where it really gets cool. I mean, at the end of the day, anybody that's in biosynthetic cannabinoid production is really developing a methodology, right? It's a process. Mm -hmm. So the end goal, I think, for everybody is a client-driven designer um, microorganism that produces, uh, you know, a biochemical profile of cannabinoids and, and other high-value ad products that um, meet the requirements of the client. So you could have a patient come forward or a company come forward saying, I want to treat X, Y, and Z symptoms or ailments. Um, you know, here's the profile we're looking for. Turn all the knobs, tweak all the buttons inside your algae, and, and out comes essentially a designer James West algae strain. Ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the world's ready for that yet. <laughs> what are the other elements that are going to be required to successfully commercialize uh, algae-grown cannabinoids in terms of regulators? So, I mean, obviously it has to be approved that you can produce cannabinoids from a different plant, right? I think that there's still a little bit of gray area now. You know, we're not growing cannabis plants, but at the end of the day, as soon as you produce those cannabinoids and they're extracted, you still have a cannabinoid. So obviously the regulations need to, you know, form and continue to develop to incorporate this. And I think that we're heading in the right direction for that. Mm -hmm. What is to say that algae is the better way relative to uh, the people who are growing on bacteria and yeast who also are making representations that they too soon will be able to produce it and they'll be able to produce it cheaper than anybody else? And uh, like, who is anybody ahead of you? Do you view anybody in the industry? Ahead I think that one of the biggest advantages that we have is that there's no mystery on how we're going to commercially produce the algae, and this is this is a big problem. So you saw this in the algae biofuel industry 10 and 15 years ago, where at a lab scale and even you know semi pilot scale, the results were incredibly encouraging and everything was working. And as soon as they went to a commercial scale, all hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the states put in a billion and a half alone into the algae industry by the time they actually had gotten their commercial plants up and running and stabilized and then ready to go. So when you look at yeast and bacteria, you just don't have the same track record. You don't have all those mistakes that were made in the past. So for us, um, you know, the science is one half of it, but the production, the production is not a challenge for us. So we bring uh, both myself and the rest of our team, our expertise and our background is the production of algae at a commercial scale. Mm -hmm. The government of Canada has made an investment in your company, have they not? Uh, back in the day, yeah. So, and oh, I, I think you're referring to the grants. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we work closely with multiple uh, organizations within the federal and provincial governments. Uh, helping support our teams. So that's how we're supposed to, or that's how we're able to have such a large and, and highly qualified team uh, without running, you know, 15, 20 million uh, um, in terms of investments to date. Mm -hmm. And so where are you developing your technology? Yeah, so we have three universities that we use. We use the University of Three Rivers. Uh, mm -hmm. There's CNET, which is a college, which is co-located, and then there's Dalhousie University. So it's set up so that the metabolic engineering is in Three Rivers. Um, uh, then we've got the actual scale up in production in CNET, and then we've got the quality control in Dalhousie. Okay. Are there any difficulties or complexities in extracting cannabinoids from algae? No. So, I mean, this is one of the other beautiful things is it's essentially just another plant. So it's other plant biomass. So it's completely drop-in friendly with the current infrastructure. So supercritical CO2 extraction, chemical extraction, mechanical press, or just don't even extract it, right? Just eat the algae. <laughs> Eat the algae. Uh, okay, so how much more capital is LGC going to be requiring to get to commercial viability? So we're doing a raise right now. So we're doing a raise for uh, three million right now, mm -hmm. and that's going to essentially take us to a point where we're we're ready to commercialize. Wow. Okay. Um, do you have any relationships in the developmental stage with any end users? We're talking to quite a few organizations at the time. Okay, so what would the be the first range of products you'd be targeting? So obviously the majors, right? The THC and CBD, and the rationale behind that is I think when you look at the biosynthesis sector a lot of people are targeting a lot of different compounds and most of the companies don't have a huge team we, you know we don't all have a quarter of a billion dollars bank account with you know 300 employees in our own you know private massive R&D facility and so the more products that you end on working on the more uh, thinly spread you are so it just becomes harder to actually produce quality work out the back end so we wanted to focus on let's get the majors out of the way and then let's start diversifying our product portfolio both in terms of cannabinoids terpenes and then other products products as well. Okay. Mather, we're going to leave it there for now. That's a great intro to the company. We'll come back to you soon and best of luck. Thanks very much.